Hello and welcome to the Ulster Hospital Laboratory. Our laboratory is based on the fourth floor of the Critical Care Building. We are made up of a team of highly skilled healthcare scientists and support staff. The laboratory is composed of three disciplines. Uh, we have clinical biochemistry, uh, microbiology, hematology and blood bank. All three disciplines provide a 24-7 service for both our primary and secondary care uh, users for the South Eastern Trust. In doing so, we process over one million samples a year. Specimen reception is responsible for the initial stage of sample processing in the laboratory. We get samples from GPs, wards and outpatients in the hospital. Some of those may be urgent and we need to look out for those and get them across to the relevant disciplines immediately. The sample types that we get are blood, urine, sputum, swabs, faeces. And the disciplines we have here at the Ulster are biochemistry, haematology and blood transfusion and microbiology. Specimen reception is responsible for checking the details on samples, checking that the correct sample has been received and that it meets all the essential criteria. Then any preparation that's needed on it is done and the details are entered into the computer by manual process where we type all the details of the patient, the tests and the sample dates into the computer or this is done by electronic order comms from the wards and where we can just scan the sample. Following this or any other preparation we distribute the samples to the relevant disciplines. Samples arrive in haematology um, either via the pneumatic sheet system or through specimen reception. So specimen reception will process anything that are routine and they'll label them up and bring them over to us. Um, anything urgent will come in pneumatic chute and we'll keep the forms here at the urgent bench so that we have them if we need to phone anything out to the wards. Each sample will get its own unique barcode that will be distinctive to that patient. Before we set the samples on the track we mix them roughly um, 8 to 10 times and then we place them on the start yard. Um, once they arrive on the start yard anything that has been labelled up and put onto the computer system um, will transmit to our analysers so they will know what samples need what test. The samples will come along the start track and then we'll move on to the first analyzer. In haematology, we have two identical analyzers um, and they process all our full blood count tests. So they will measure your haemoglobin, white cells and platelet counts. Okay, so whenever the sample has been processed for its full blood count, which is our main haematology test, it will move to the next um, part of the track, which is our slide stainer. What it does is it'll aspirate some of the patient's sample. Um, it'll spread it onto a slide, it'll dry it, um, and send any information regarding that patient on it so that we can locate it easily afterwards. Um, with these slides then, um, our trained biomedical scientists will look under the microscope for um, various reasons. It could be uh, maybe a new form of leukaemia, um, diagnosing an anemia, it could be a multitude of things. The samples are sent down the track to our interliner ASR analyzer, but our analyzer has a calculation on board that allows it to um, process within half an hour so we can get the results back quicker to the patient. Um, so it's just something to note that if a sample is going to be requested for an FPC and an ASR, it'll take an additional 30 minutes on top of your full blood count request. Whenever the sample has had its full blood count, its ESR and its slide, um, our analyzer has a storage capability, so it'll archive all our samples for us um, in these two main racks. Um, it'll put them in a specific position, so if we need to go back to that particular sample for whatever reason, we know how to easily look at it. We also have the ability to carry out some specialised testing here, so we would do specialist cytochemistry tests, um, malarial screens, sickle cell, and actually we're the regional centre for plasma viscosities. This is the coagulation section. Um, here we look at coagulation and clotting. Um, over here the samples are slightly different to haematology. In haematology we've seen the purple top EDTA tubes and here we have blue top sodium citrate samples and the difference really is the anticoagulant that they contain. So in coagulation uh, we're quite strict about our, our minimum fill. So here they must be filled to the minimum fill line. Here before we process the samples uh, we will spin them down a centrifuge to separate the plasma from the red cells. And the reason we do that is because that is the um, section of the, the component of the blood that we're interested in. The plasma contains the coagulation factors uh, and that's what's necessary for clotting, so that's what we're measuring here. Uh, 
I've said about the minimum fill and the reason we're quite strict about that over in coagulation is because uh, the sodium citrate that's present in these tubes is a liquid anticoagulant whereas the EDTA in this tube is spread on and it's more like a powder. Um, so before you fill this tube there's already a bit of a dilution, dilutional effect by having a liquid in there before you start. So that, that's the reason that we would be quite strict about so that. So the way these analyzers work is um, they will process the sample on a rack, a barcoded rack similar to hematology. Um, it'll aspirate out some of the plasma and the reagents on board will combine into a small cuvette such as this. It'll shine a light through and the length of time it takes for the light to no longer be able to shine through is the length of time it takes to clot and it uh, utilises a method known as optical density in order to measure this. In coagulation, any samples that are grossly hemolyzed or lipemic uh, will flag up by the analyzer and let us know. Um, then a trained biomedical scientist would come along and examine those samples um, and investigate if they were, um, the results were accurate or not. Any results then will be uh, sent back to our main computer screens and we'll vet them out and send them to the clinical area. This is the blood bank department. Uh, samples arrive here either by the pneumatic chute system or they're delivered over by specimen reception, but they'll never be labelled uh, by specimen reception. We keep the forms and samples ourselves here. Um, so the sample is labelled up and a corresponding label put onto the form. The analytical stage here is to spin the sample down in a centrifuge to separate the plasma from the red cells. Um, and once they've been spun down, then they go onto the racks and are sent onto our um, analyzers. As with the other sections, uh, we have two identical analyzers, again, to maintain workflow. Um, one we will specifically keep for um, antibody identification and cross matches, and the other for group and screens, which are our main test requests. In the Southeastern Trust, we have a policy in place that means that we will not transfuse patients unless we have a confirmed sample in place. So um, it's beneficial to get a confirmed sample to us as quickly as possible um, in order for us to release the blood to the patient and the clinical area. When people come in here, they're usually quite um, amazed that this is the only stock of blood that we have for the entire hospital, but this is it. Um, we can get more blood from the um, Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion Service, but really on a daily basis, this is all we have to work with. Um, so we keep uh, various amounts of each different blood type, uh, depending on how common they are in the population and how frequently we think we might need them. Um, we keep only 12 units of emergency well, of O-negative blood. Um, of that, we keep four for emergency purposes. So if we were to get um, perhaps maybe a car crash or something urgent um, or a massive blood transfusion protocol was initiated, um, we have blood that we can issue. Whilst we hold um, packed red cells, we also have a, um, various other blood products. Um, we hold albumin here, um, anti-D for maternity patients, um, human immunoglobulin and prothrombin complex concentrate as well as frozen products such as fresh frozen plasma and um, cryoprecipitate. When blood is requested for a patient for a cross match, they can either be requested on that regional form or via telephone um, if they phone the blood bank. Whenever blood has been cross matched, um, we will issue it to that specific patient and notify the clinical area that it is ready for collection. Then the clinical area will send a porter or um, a member of the community, if it's in the case of a Marie Curie hospice patient, or a district nurse to collect the blood and this is the room that they do it in. So we have an issue fridge, um, an issue platelet agitator and then our ledger. Uh, we put the unit of blood into the fridge or the uh, platelet into the agitator. The blood transfusion policy of the South Eastern Trust complies with the current BCSH guidelines in that a patient's blood group is confirmed with a second sample prior to transfusion. The blood bank will contact the clinical area should a confirmation sample be required. This is a microbiology laboratory. Um, in the microbiology laboratory, we detect microorganisms associated with causing disease, such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. We also would determine treatment options, um, and this is done largely by antimicrobial susceptibility testing. In terms of the samples we receive, we would receive a various uh, range of sample types, and I'm gonna be showing you some of those as we move along. In this section, we would process uh, a number of swabs, fluids, and tissues. Swabs would be received up in containers like this. So the swabs will have been taken, placed into the container, this fluid at the bottom, and any bacteria present will be in the bottom of the container. The samples are then added to this rack, where they'll be then processed on our walk-away specimen processor, which I'll show you now. This is our walkaway specimen processor, it's called the Previ Isola. And how it works is we load up 
all the media that we require for each particular sample type onto the left hand side. Then the samples that we want processed, we just put into this compartment. Check that the correct plates have been loaded um, on the left hand side and then start. The fluid from the bottom of the container is aspirated onto each appropriate uh, media type. You can see down here possibly there's a, a, label, a labeler and this labeler will label each individual plate with the excision number and patient details. And once this specimen's been processed, we will get it out here in this output cassette, which I'll be able to show you an example in a minute. And the samples have been processed. The plates which have been inoculated with the fluid from the swabs, they come out uh, into these in output cassettes. So you'll be able to see here um, how they're labelled up. So they're labelled up with the excision number as well as the type of swab that, that was initially um, put onto the system. So these, one, these plates here are typical plates we would set up for a wound swab. This is a, a culture plate after 24 hours incubation. You can see the bacterial colonies growing the whole way around the plate. Um, but what's most useful to us are these individual colonies at the end where we can do further work on and help determine the antibiotic of choice for the patient. Hello, my name's Elaine and I'm going to tell you today about our blood culture section. We receive approximately between 20 and 30 blood cultures per day. So your blood is normally a sterile fluid, so there shouldn't be any bacteria growing there and if there are, then obviously your patient has a problem. So basically what happens is that if your patient spikes the temperature, the doctors and the nurses will take a blood culture, a set of blood cultures. So we will receive something like this. So what happens um, straight away is that we will be checking the details to make sure that there's no mistakes made between the sample that we've received and the form that we've received. That's so important. You definitely don't want to be reporting anything on the wrong patient. <laughs> right, so the first thing that happens is you divide the form from the bottle. Remove your bottles. Again, check in your details. Everything matches. Good stuff. And we give it an accession number. Now this links our bottles with our, our form. The next thing we're going to do is load our blood cultures into our 37 degree incubator. So in order to do that, I'm going to press this button here, scan the barcode again, and load it in to the incubator. Second one, scan the barcode. Okay. And seal that up quickly. Now, those blood cultures will stay in there for five days. If the blood culture is negative and there's no bacteria present in the blood, then they'll quite happily sit in there for five days and it will be re released after that time as a no growth. If, however, there are bacteria present in your blood, they will start to multiply and produce carbon dioxide. Here we have a negative bottle and the base of the bottle has stayed green, so that will be reported as no growth. Okay. Here, however, we have a positive bottle and you can see there's been a reaction at the base of the bottle and the carbon dioxide has caused the colour change and the incubator has detected it. So the biomedical scientist's job then is to go and process this bottle, which I'll show you next. We have a positive blood culture. The analyzer has just let us know with this nice yellow screen and it is making a horrible noise. I don't know if you can pick that up, but it gives us a, a sound alert as well. So in order to remove this bottle, we need to hit the positive button. It is now telling us to go to the drawer and it should be lit up. See that it's lit up. It's telling me that the positive blood culture is in this drawer. We remove it. And we and pretty much then we just tell the machine that we have found it and that we are now processing it. The next step then is to find the form that is attached to this bottle. So we've taken our positive blood culture into our safety cabinet and 
Tyler here is going to process this positive sample for us. So we have our positive bottle, and Tyler is now going to try and inoculate the blood from the bottle onto the plates. The first step he's going to do is sterilize the top of the bottle with alcohol, and then he's going to use a subculture unit which has a needle on one side and a little channel on the other. So the needle goes into the top of the septum, and he removes the sterile cover, and the channel is just here at the top. And when he tips the bottle upside down, the blood will flow slowly and hopefully freely from the bottle onto the agar, just like so. Now, he's going to manually spread the blood out across the plate, unlike our Previ automated machine. This section is all done manually, so he's making a well at the top of the plate, and he's streaking out that blood for single colonies. The next stage you're going to do is a gram stain. So again, he's going to prepare a glass slide and drop the blood onto the top of the surface. He's going to spread that out to make a thin smear. And then he's going to heat fix it on a hot plate. Okay. And the next stage, when that dries, we will perform a gram stain, which is where he's going to flood up several different reagents to reveal the actual bugs that are present in that blood. And then we'll look at that under the microscope, and that's our first clue as to the bacteria that are present in this bottle. We have the result of our gram stain here on screen. You can see this is the blood smear actually on, under the microscope. We've just flicked it up on a camera here for the purposes of the video. And you can see in the background, these are all bursted white blood cells all in the background in the blood itself. But you can see these very obvious little gram-positive cocci that are present in the blood, and these are actually the bacteria growing within your blood. As soon as we see this result, that's when we will phone the ward and let them know what we've seen in the blood film. So in this case, it's gram-positive cocci in clusters, and when they are aware of that, they will make their medical staff aware in the ward, and we will let our consultants know up here in the lab, and then they will liaise together and get the right treatment for your patient. So the next sample I'm going to talk about is our CSF, which is cerebral spinal fluid. Now this is taken when there's a query of meningitis or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So what happens is on the wards, um, they would take a lumbar puncture and it would be decanted into three bottles. And they should be numbered in the order that they're taken one, two and three because that's important. I'll explain now why. It's because the first one that we would normally keep, it might have red cells in it. So we would keep that one as for, for referral for viruses or something. The second one, we would do our bacteriology work on it. So the first thing we do then would be take the bottle, decant the contents into the centrifuge tube, spin it down, and that concentrates any bacteria that are present in the base of the conical tube. And then again, we would inoculate our plates and perform a gram stain. On each bottle, we would also conduct a cell count to make sure if there's any cells present, if that was, um, it would indicate whether it was a viral infection or a bacterial infection. Okay, and then the third bottle, we would send to biochemistry for pro protein and glucose, and we work quite closely with our colleagues in biochemistry to get the full result issued to the ward as soon as possible. We're in our epidemiology section now, so this is where we screen for MRSA, and we do our neonatal screens here as well. All the little babies in the neonatal units get checked out here. Okay, so we would receive upwards of between 50 swabs per day in this section, and basically what we're doing is screening to make sure there's no MRSA present, and the result goes out then within 12 to 18 hours. However, um, if there is MRSA present, then um, a whole gamut of control of infection swings in then and be reported as such. Now, a negative sample is going to look something like this, and thankfully most of these are. However, when we do detect an MRSA, we use chromogenic agar in this section, and if there's MRSA present, it looks like that. So, obviously, if we see something like this, we report it straight away to our consultants and our control infection team and then they notify the wards and act appropriately. This is the Category 3 laboratory. Uh, in the Category 3 laboratory, we process faeces and sputums. Um, in terms of the sputum samples or respiratory samples, um, we use these to help determine co any cause of lower respiratory tract infection. Um, a couple of examples of bacteria that we may isolate from, from a sputum sample are Haemophilus influenza or Streptococcus pneumonia. In terms of faeces, um, 
there are a number of examinations carried out there as well, um, examining for enteric infection um, and examples of bacteria that we may isolate. As you've probably heard of some of these, uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter and C. difficile. Um, we'll also look for parasites. Um, so if a patient has been away on a foreign travel to some exotic country, um, they may have uh, brought home a parasite. So again, we'll, we'll examine that in here. Um, all, all work is carried out here in category three. So we may deal with high risk spe specimens. So we could have a risk of TB from the sputum sample. So everything has to be um, carried out in here. We wear blue colored coats um, because we don't want to bring anything that we may have been working with out into the rest of the laboratory. Um, so it's very, very much protecting ourselves and protecting uh, everyone else as well. In our urine section now, so every single day we receive between 250 and 300 samples per day and each one of those is looked at directly through microscopy and we will culture every single urine as well. Okay, so pretty much what happens is um, every sample in its microscopy, they want to pass it through the machine, it takes 10 snapshots and brings up the pictures on the screen. This result is then transferred to our computer and then we look at the direct result along with what we have grown the next day to make our analysis on whether it's an infection or not. If it is a negative sample, then we get a nice plate like this, which is all no growth. There's six samples in this plate and every one of them is negative. If, however, there, there is a urinary tract infection present, we'll see something like this. Now, if I show you this side of the plate, you can see there's three organisms grown on three different patients there. So it's our job then to sub that out and identify what antibiotics are most appropriate. An antibiotic plate would look something like this. So I can show it that way. You can see in this plate, three antibiotics are useful and three are not in this case. This is what we deal with mostly in biochemistry here, these yellow top samples. We get about 1,600 of these a day and we do about an average of 15 tests on each sample. The first thing that happens is all of our samples go on to uh, this pre-analytics module here, uh, which is called the MPA. What it does is it scans a barcode on each sample, makes sure that it's registered in our computer system. It checks to see what tests are required against it. And then it goes about processing that sample and getting it ready for analysis. Uh, the first thing it does is it spins the sample in a centrifuge, which separates the, the blood component off from the serum component. We're more interested in the, in the liquid portion uh, of the blood, the, the serum and uh, then aliquots that off for analysis and that gets sent on to our analyzers. The original sample is then capped and it gets archived and then we can retrieve it if we need to do anything more with it at a later, a later stage. The first thing we have here is what's called an ISE module which stands for ion sensitive electrode. Well, these can do about 2000 tests an hour. It's very quick, it takes about three seconds per sample and it's very accurate. So this is our 701 module, this is our primary chemistry analyzer. It's about 400 cubets in it, individual cubets, so it can run uh, about 400 tests at the same time. Um, we use this for measuring things like total protein and glucose, stuff you find in the serum of the body in quite high quantities normally. And because you're looking for a color change, there needs to be enough of it there to cause that color change to happen. So this is what we call our 502 module, which is another um, spectrophotometer. Is instead of measuring a color change, you add an antibody specific to, to whatever you're looking for to the cuvette and the sample material, you mix it together. And as the antibody binds to whatever you're looking for, it turns the solution cloudy as it comes out of solution. And then you measure the amount of light absorbed. So it's a little bit different and uh, it's used mainly for looking for different proteins, for example, C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker that's very good uh, for judging level of infection and uh, doctors like to use it so they can see if someone's uh, recovering from an infection. This is what we call an immunoassay analyzer. With this here, we can raise an antibody to whatever we're looking for, say, for example, thyroid stimulating hormone. And it basically allows us to do a lot more care. Diabetic patients have to closely monitor their blood glucose levels. One of the ways in which we can determine if they're maintaining a blood glucose control over a longer period of time is called an HbA1c. So instead of a blood glucose level, which gives you a rough idea of how good diabetic control has been over the past 24 hours, 
An HbA1c gives you a very good idea of how good blood glucose control has been over the past 90 days. The way it's analyzed is on this machine here, which uses HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography. What happens is the blood cells are sampled. They're then broken apart or hemolyzed. They're passed through an ion exchange column where all the hemoglobin binds to the, the beads in the column. We then pass through one of these eluting reagents and we change the ratio of the two reagents. And as that changes, it eludes off the different HPA uh, or hemoglobin compounds. And depending on the time that they are eluted off, we can determine what the specific component is. And then we get a nice, nice little graph and we have a look at it by measuring the the area of the peaks, we can determine how much HbA1c there is in the sample. So this is the manual section of biochemistry where we primarily deal with protein electrophoresis. Uh, it's used for looking for signs of a leukemia-like condition called multiple myeloma. We use this machine here, which is a capillary electrophoresis machine. Is it passes a small amount of serum from blood through a very narrow capillary and applies an electric charge to it. And because all the stuff in your blood is meant to be sort of different size shapes and charges, it can separate it out based on size and charge. Um, we get um, a couple of lovely graphs. We're really looking for is any abnormalities right at the very end of that graph. Um, so in one example that I've shown you, you have a normal pattern where you have just a nice sort of hump at the end of it. And in the other one, I've shown you an abnormal pattern where you have a massive spike, which is that monoclonal protein that we're looking for and that will be dealt with by our haematologist. So when you take a blood sample and send it up to the laboratory, obviously it takes a little bit of time for the results to come back. Uh, we have a turnaround time of 90 minutes for our urgent samples, four hours for samples taken from wards, and 24 hours for samples taken from the GP. 